Angela, what's happening, man? Welcome back to Austin. Man, thanks for having me here. Wimberley native, right? I was born in Wimberley, but I, I grew up in Austin. I moved here, I think, the week before I turned one. Nice. So, but I mean, for anyone who's not from Texas, Wimberley is like 45 minutes from Austin. So, met your wife at Barton Springs? I did. I met my wife wow. at Barton Springs. What a true, and my, true love story. <laughs> my parents met at Barton Springs. No way. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. Two generations of that. Two generations. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's cool to have your, uh, your kids here too, right? And get to experience all the Austin things that you love. Oh, man. It's awesome. Yeah. We stay, I was telling you guys, we stay pretty close to Barton Springs and I like wake them up and like they, I'll get them to run with me to Barton Springs and get all like hot and sweaty and get in the pool. And it's just, uh, it's awesome. It's is like it, a dream. Is it cool seeing how much Austin has grown being you know, somewhat native to, to Austin? Yeah. You know, it, I, have, I feel like people who have stayed here because uh, I left 15 years ago or something, I feel like they kind of complain about how much it's changed and blah, blah, blah. And sorry, blah, blah, blah. You can tell my, uh, <laughs> my, my attitude about it. But even when I was a kid here, it was one of the fastest growing cities. So it's mm-hmm. always been a place that people were flocking to, I think, because of whatever the unique cultural kind of combinations and influences are that are here and, and the natural, you know, features of Barton Springs and the river and lakes, et cetera. And, um, I think it's cool, man. I like the, I think the way that it's changing is, uh, it's cool. It's becoming, it's become a city. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It didn't used to be a city and it's, it's a real city, just like driving into the show today and, coming into this big building downtown. It's this like, didn't exist a couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah. There was like, I think the, the, the first bank tower, whatever, there was some like tiny bank tower was the biggest building when I left here. Mm. So. Dude, we had a lot of fun doing prep for this podcast and we were telling you off air, you know, Harry and I were expecting to have, you know, just focus on an amazing conversation around the incredible brand you guys have built a key on, do a deep dive into essential amino acids, protein, supplements, health, all the stuff you love to talk about. And then we were listening to you on the Skinny Confidential and we were blown away by your story and how early you matured and some of the incredible experiences being in India. We didn't know that. We didn't even know that about your backstory. So we're pumped to dig into that a little bit. So I guess to start, you know, where was Angelo circa like 2005, 2006? Whoa, 2005, <laughs> 2006. I was, I was in Austin. Those you years, were, yeah, I was still in Austin. I was in, um, I was 21. In 2000, I turned 21 in 2005. So I was going to college at St. Edwards University up on Congress. Oh, yeah. And I was, um, well, I'm, I'm thinking, like, what's the interesting part of this, like, of that time period? I think I had, like, you, as you had said, I grew up very fast. I had mm-hmm. some pretty intense traumatic stuff I went through when I was 16 and then became emancipated when I was 17. And um, yeah, I was just like busting my ass working and then got into college. Mm-hmm. And in college, I was doing a deep, deep dive on like the personal, the Angelo personal development project. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. I was taking 21 hours and I was like studying philosophy and religion and music and dance and yoga and uh, running barefoot on the hike and bike trail and experimenting with whatever kind of weird different food and nutrition and diet Mm -hmm. stuff I was doing back then to try to just like figure out life. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you had a lot of this stuff figured out at an early age. Like the way that I understand it, you were 17, like a freshman ish in college, and you were into like Sally, what is it, Sally Fenton or the West Fallon, Nate, yeah. Fallon, the, yeah, the uh, Weston yeah, Price, West Price stuff. Yeah. stuff. You were mm. saunaing, cold plunging, doing all this stuff before it was cool. You were just on this wild journey of self discovery at a super young age. I don't know if you could say it's before it was cool because I think like in Austin at that time period, it wasn't like I was discovering it all by myself. Like mm-hmm. people were, this, and this has always been, I think, an alternative health town. That's why my parents came here. Like my parents were in the, my dad was literally in the, he was importing botanicals, like supplements, the raw ingredients, ginseng. He was a big ginseng importer uh, in the seventies in Austin. Wow. And, um, you know, we were, getting acupuncture and I was going with my mom to the chiropractor, you know, when I was like three. So, um, (laughs) some of these things I was like, it was just happening in Austin. It's life for you. But I would say that like, as a kid that age, you know, at 17, um, I, uh, the basic story, I guess, is when I was 16, I had this very provocative experience. We might call it, I took way too much LSD. I provoked a fight that I didn't intend to. I was basically just scared looking for help, but mm-hmm. other people 
didn't understand that. They're much more hardcore than me. They stabbed me multiple times and they, they beat the shit out of me basically until I was very, very close to dead. And I woke up in the hospital several days later. Um, I mean, just totally black and blue and with abdominal, you know, I had to have a huge scar here. They had to cut all the way through my abdomen mm-hmm. because they assumed I was, you know, all my internal organs were totally fucked from getting stabbed in the back and uh, stabbed in the knee. My patella tendon was severed. So I was very immobile um, for quite some time. And, you know, I think that combined with the psychological impact of, I mean, I think just the psychological impact of getting hurt. Like if you were in a car accident, totally right? And then if you add on to that, you're in a violent accident where like someone, you know, (laughs) you, you experience someone else's fear, hate, anger, whatever that is. And however much you provoked it or not, like you just experience that mm. on top of that combined with way too much acid, mm-hmm. like <laughs> just any one of those on their own is like plenty. And the recovery period from that, you know, I think it's been 20 years probably of re- recovery from that integrating what that means. And, um, you know, it, it going from experience to wisdom, you know, mm-hmm. I think you got to like, figure out what it means and, and integrate the pieces of, of the things you get exposed to or taught in life. But um, yeah, all that really, I think there were plenty of other kids, I have kids, 17 year olds um, that happened when I was 16 and a half. And really the, the course of the next year is really when it like everything turned for me. By the time I was 17 is when I moved out and emancipated myself. Um, I embraced it. You know, it wasn't just like, oh, in the surroundings, you could get turned on to these, mm-hmm. you know, these types of uh, diets mm-hmm. and um, seeking about nutrition or spiritual stuff, meditation, um, cold exposure, barefoot running. But I went after it because I was exposed to the fragility of death, I think, mm-hmm. and the fragility of my own mind and of how important it is to choose. Because if you don't choose, or you choose kind of um, without really without really trying to choose. And I just mean make decisions, like whatever yeah. the decision is you make today about what you're going to do, um, choosing who you're going to hang out with, choosing what you're going to do tonight, choosing what you're going to do tomorrow. Um, they they have they can have really big repercussions. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you see it immediately, like I experienced that evening. <laughs> and sometimes um, we're maybe even less fortunate. We don't realize how it builds up over ten years. You make these little tiny decisions and 10 years later, you realize, damn it. Like, man, I didn't realize that was going to, mm. it was going to calcify mm. and I was going to be kind of, you know, stuck like this. So, mm. yeah. So I was very interested in much of the, um, whether it's alternative health or cutting edge health or whatever that type of stuff was that was available to me because, um, yeah, I think I, I was turned on to like, whoa, yeah. this shit's real. Do, do you ever think about what your life would look like if that, traumatic event didn't happen to you? I don't Mm. ever think about that. I don't, it's weird. You know, I don't know that it could not happen to me. Mm. And and that's not saying that I, um, that's not give, that's not some like philosophy, you know, some like fate or destiny thing. Mm. Well, maybe it is. I I was going to say it's not that. And then I feel like whatever I'm about to say is going to (laughs) maybe make it sound like it is. You know, I think um, I've spent a lot of time the last few years I've gone through all different types of therapy, like physical therapy, psychotherapy, medi- like really intense meditation retreats, different ways of kind of exploring my sensations, my emotions, my thoughts, my mind. And um, the last few years, I've done a lot of psychoanalysis, which is basically just showing up, mm. getting on a couch and just talking about what comes up. And through that, um, well, I engaged in that process because I thought, you know, there's still got to be like a lot of like just weird stuff from the trauma of those experiences. And then as you guys listen to my story, I have more bizarre ass traumatic stories (laughs) that come after this. But, um, you know, I think I I thought that I needed to really like still unravel what that was and what was inside there. And what I realized was, I think I started to explore maybe even more, wow, what provoked that? Like, it seems so random. And yet, I put, I did put myself, like I said, these choices in situations in which something that bizarre could happen. And I do think there's parts of like my childhood and just growing up and like who my family was and, um, a whole bunch of other things that came together that kind of turned into that. So whether that 
was exactly what needed to happen or would happen or did happen. It, it, it is what happened. And it's, it's kind of hard for me to imagine that I wouldn't have pushed the boundaries in some other way. So I almost just feel lucky that right. I pushed the boundaries in such a way that somehow my spleen only barely got nicked mm-hmm. and my patella tendon could be reattached. You know, I could go run the hike and bike trail in Austin today. Right. And, um, and because I am supported, like I, I got access to resources to try to figure it out. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a, I, you know, I get to be a successful businessman and have a family and be happy today. You know, it's like, um, but it's hard for me to imagine that I wouldn't provoke some other bizarre ass thing, right. you know, somewhere else <laughs> down then, the line. Yeah, they would have challenged me, and I would have to learn from that. And um, you know, I think um, I wouldn't wish that upon anyone that experience. For me, it has, it, it has, I believe, defined me in a very positive way. Mm-hmm. It's a really bizarre double-edged sword because you would never wish it upon anyone yet. In some ways, it really seems like that catalyzed your growth at a really young age too. Um, I've heard you, you, you've said the term um, emancipated. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why you use the term emancipated versus moved out? Like, is there, is there a difference between those terms? Yeah. I think it's, I mean, you basically just become responsible for yourself. You become, you know, financially and legally responsible for yourself. So, Mm -hmm. so you very intentionally made the decision when you were 17, like, you know, I'm moving out of the house. I'm going to be on my own. I'm just going to figure this out and just go through this period of like hyper accelerated growth on my own. Was that kind of the thought process there? Yeah, I think it was. I don't know that. I don't think it was as like as thoughtful as you're describing. Yeah. <laughs> it was a bit more 17 year old boy yeah. than like you. That sounds much more. That sounds like my 39 year old interpretation. I might, <laughs> yeah. I might make it sound like that. I think it was. Um, my man, you know, so that stabbing experience happened when I was 16 and a half and I went through a bunch of legal stuff just trying to sort out all that stuff and I got through it I turned 17 through that I've been doing I've been doing therapy trying to figure out my life and I'm just like I I don't know man I just felt called I just felt called to like I need to just because my family life at that time there was a lot of conflict between my parents my parents had been getting divorced there was a lot of conflict in the Mm -hmm. whole like soup of the whole thing and um I, I just wanted to get out on my own. But I think there was probably more of a mix of like the same, it was, it was the same young rambunctious young man that took way too much LSD and got his ass stabbed in South Austin, mm-hmm. you know, that, that wanted to like, well, I'm ready to like take care of myself now, you know? And uh, I had gone through a lot in those six months where clear, I, clearly I was capable. I did mm-hmm. figure it out. I did do it. You know, and um, yeah, I supported myself the second, you know, my second half of my junior year and all through my senior year and was able to get into college and get scholarships. And, uh, but I, I don't, it wasn't that thoughtful. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. I, we, we, I, wish, we, I wish. wish. Was there anything that you were experimenting with at the time that allowed you to reform your life in a positive way? You mentioned a few things like the barefoot running, traveling, playing instruments. Was there anything that, you were drawn to in particular that really helped you start to solidify some of these changes and like really push you? Yeah, I I think it's, I mean, I think it was several things. I think it definitely was nutrition. Mm. I really started, I mean, I was raised in a family that was super serious about nutrition and talked about kind of like not worship nutrition, but was like really into nutrition and talked about it a lot. And then when I became an adolescent, I just started exploring and doing my own thing. I'm like, I'm going to go to Taco Bell and McDonald's with my yeah. friends and party and drink and like just kind of do whatever. And I came back to like, oh, wow, like I should really be, you know, it's like when I got back, I got like on the whey protein game, you know, mm-hmm. when I was 16 or whatever, like from that experience and, and trying to like, yeah, just really think about protein nutrition again. Think about honestly, like for me, vegetables and fruits were important. Uh, just trying to like eat whole foods and like not be this kid just eating junk food with mm-hmm. his friends and partying. Um, yeah, so I, I got really serious about like preparing my own food. Mm. And uh, I got really serious about um, exercise. It was basically running. And I think barefoot running, I mean, I don't know how good it was for me or not, but it was like, it was, an, it was extreme. We were talking about Iron Man before the yeah. show. You know, it's like, my feet had to adapt to it and it was all on the hike and bike trail. I remember it was like just being like it stinging, but I loved it. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was, that that was good for me. I think just like though, 
cardiovascular exercise mm. was good for my brain and my heart. Um, and I was super, I still am like, I like resistance training, but I really like calisthenics. Like there, I just love mm. doing pull-ups and dips and sit-ups and squats. So like, I just, I love it, man. I just, I get obsessed when I get back to town to Austin. Like I just go to that pull-up bar yeah. down on the hike and bike trails, and I just try to like crush as many as I can do. Um, and then I think it's, um, the main other things were like meditation. I got really into silent meditation and having a daily practice of that, which I think for me, I, I, I equate meditation, journaling, certain types of therapy, like psychoanalysis, kind of like the same stuff. Mm. It's like, you just let whatever's in you come out mm. and you observe what comes out and you release it. Like you don't get really attached to whatever the thoughts are. Mm. Uh, I think that was really helpful for me because I think I was just had a bunch of bottled up thoughts. And the last thing is I think a relationship. I ended up having like a really important girlfriend that like the summer before my senior year and that whole period. And I think um, being in a relationship with someone who like cared about me and I cared about her and just trying to like, man, just um, be a good human mm. in it, which was like, I think for a 17 year old boy, it's like pretty hard. It's pretty, it's pretty hard. <laughs> It's, it's a big like, ask. It's yeah. a big ask, man. I just like feel pretty obsessed with myself and all my interests and all my things I'm trying to do. So I think, yeah, I think those were like the key things. But yeah, I mean, sauna was big. I think cold was big. I think acupuncture was really big. I did a ton of acupuncture because mm -hmm. I think my nervous system was just kind of jacked. Mm. Um, kind of an off-topic question, but you, you made me think about this with the whole Austin connection. As an Austin OG, how cool was Whole Foods back in the day compared to what it is now? Because we've heard that it used to be incredible, like in the 90s and 2000s and stuff like that. Cool. I mean, it was so I, better, maybe better. I mean, I actually have an interesting thing here, not to like expose my dad too much, but so we lived in Wimberley and we actually moved to Austin because my dad did a partnership with Whole Foods for like the original restaurant business or whatever. And it didn't go great. It ended. Mm -hmm. And my dad had kind of like a, not a great attitude about Whole Foods. So we never went to Whole okay. Foods. <laughs> we'd go to like Wheatsville Food Co-op or we'd go to like all these other places. My mom will, would go to Whole Foods. So um, like, yeah, it's funny. I had, I mean, I grew up going, I grew up going there as a kid uh, with my mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it was, it's funny, man. It was like super... Uh, it was just way more hippie. The whole town was way more hippie. Like I just remember, like, like this dude Jimmy. I don't know, man. I wonder if he's still in town. Who uh, <laughs> was like this? Uh, I mean, for me, he was like some, he was like a tall black dude with dreads and was deaf and just reeked like patchouli. And yeah. he would rollerblade everywhere. Uh, but I have memories of him like rollerblading at the old Whole Foods and like bagging groceries and stuff. <laughs> like it was just a very like crunchy hippie vibe. Mm. Um. But yeah, I mean, and then, I don't know, in college, I'd probably go there every single, I'd like, I'd ride my bike to Barton Springs and then ride back to the Whole Foods up at six. But it wasn't, it wasn't the one that's there now. It was like okay. where the REI is now. Okay. Gotcha. At Six and Lamar. Yeah. Cause we've had on a couple yeah. ranchers that were early into Whole Foods in like the early 2000s, maybe even earlier than that, honestly. And they always say like, you know, back in the day, the people that were actually working in the stores were health enthusiasts. And if you needed a supplement or a protein oh, yeah. powder- they could direct you to exactly what you needed. All the all the beef was coming from local Texas farms, and it's unfortunately just really like a far cry of what it's gotten to now. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was something totally different. It was a much. I think they were public then. It was big, but it wasn't mm -hmm. like. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking like literally, like I was born in 1984, so we moved here in 80. Like Whole Foods was created in 81 or 82 or something mm -hmm. like that. So it's like my I was thinking like 1990. Yeah, you know, Whole Foods. It was yeah. like definitely. Uh, it wasn't for everyone. Yeah. I mean, just the whole like health food organic thing was not. It was nowhere close to as popular as it is now. It like definitely it, had a bigger hippie undertone than like organic. I feel like there was definitely more of a connotation around it being more hippie than mainstream. And now yeah, that, that term has kind of just been normalized. Yeah, now it's like a, it's like a yuppie thing. Yeah, you know? it's like if you have <laughs> totally. Yeah, if you have like enough money then you care to try to buy this more premium food. Whereas then it was much more, I think, uh, I mean, probably closer now to where like people that are really committed to regenerative farming, right? right. And meat that comes from, you know, regenerative farming and, and ranches, et cetera, or people that are, um, yeah, just more committed to whatever the more niche 
uh, really interesting, you know, ideas are. Yeah. What, um, what period of your life did you really start to develop an interest in business and start to think, Hey, maybe like the supplement or health space is really what I want to get into. I don't know. I was like two, two. <laughs> <Parents>. <laughs> yeah. I mean, second chance. Yeah. I never even really, um, yeah. I mean, my parents were, I've never, my parents have never had a job that I saw them have like as a kid, like they just always had their own businesses. I mean, they, um, yeah, they just always had their own businesses. And when I was really little, it was the health food and supplement business. That's like what they, that's what they did. But I just remember when I was little, it's like, I just didn't even, you know, like my dad didn't go to college. I just didn't even think I would go to college. I just assumed I would be a businessman. Like that's what people in my family do. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom did go to college. She actually has a master's degree uh, from UT in accounting and was like that, but she always had her own firm and did her own thing. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I just like, I always thought I was going to be a, a businessman. I don't think I thought it was going to be like supplements though. Yeah. You know, when I, uh, when I went to college and I was on this big seeker path, I was not thinking about like being like a businessman. I was more like, am I, do I, you know, do I want to be like in physical health space? You know, some kind of like, uh, I don't even know what exactly it looked like a nutritionist type, that type of thing, but more like more holistic health coach. Yeah. Or do I want to be more like on the spiritual side or be like a psychologist or like those were the types of things I was thinking about. So in college, I studied stuff more like within that frame. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just got way more passionate about, honestly, at that time, like about cultures and about um, people and life and the meaning of life and things like that. And so that took me into like studying other languages. And then, so when, when, when I was graduating, I was like, I just want to do stuff overseas. And I, and so I moved to France, right. When I graduated college and, uh, and I didn't know exactly what that would turn into, but pretty quickly it was like, it switched back from like cultural stuff to like, I want to be an international businessman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that was the thing. It was like, I'm going to use my languages and this kind of my ability to like get along with lots of different types of people and learn languages and, and do like that kind of thing. I'm going to use that to my advantage to do business. And I followed that path for several years until um, basically it was time in 2012 to, um, to move back to the States because my fiance like really wanted to have kids. Mm -hmm. And it was like, and I finally like heard it. I mean, yeah. I think again, all these times I like to imagine I'm like this much more like m mature young male, but I'm like a pretty self-absorbed dude trying to like live the best life, be a badass, you know, be a good person, but like, um, not to the degree of like my wife is probably like a really good person. Yeah. <laughs> was, was France your first time living overseas? That was my first time living overseas. I did a lot of extensive travel in college. I spent, um, spent a summer in India. I spent a summer in Central America. I spent not quite a summer in Mexico. Um, I was supposed to go to Amman, Jordan for a year, mm -hmm. but I had kind of, I was involved in this really intense bus accident in India that like, I was pretty traumatized after mm -hmm. that. So I was like, I don't think I'm going to Jordan for a year after <laughs> yeah. this. I'm pretty like done with developing countries for a while. Yeah. Um, and, but then, you know, I, the bug was still in me. So France was a much safer, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, kind of like she, you know, like, uh, yeah, just safer place. But after a few years there, then I moved to India. And I lived mm. in India for a while before moving back to back to the States. How did some of those travels shape how you started to think about your passions and what you wanted to do afterwards? Uh, I think, you know, I think going back to like, maybe like the, 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 uh, the gratitude that I have for trauma in my life or the gratitude for just like hard shit that's happened to me is perspective. Because if you think about life in terms of perspective and you consider life maybe even just like an, it's not this simple, but like an absolute value scale. If you have all these great opportunities, everything's on the positive, on the plus side. Mm. And when you go through really difficult things, it broadens your like absolute value scale. Suddenly it's not, you're not just building positive, positive, positive. You suddenly broadened it. And it's like maybe your whole perspective of life is twice as big. And I think that um, living overseas, it not only there's hard stuff, but things that you thought were um, like the way things are, you, you understand that they're entirely made up. 
And there's no better way than that than learning another language where you just think that like, oh, this is the way that you say something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe there's like expressions that don't make sense. Like it's raining cats and dogs. And like you try to say it in another language, it doesn't make sense. But I'm talking about like fundamental like grammar. You know, like in French, not to get too, too of a weird like grammar nerding out thing here. Because I told you guys that before the show, I'm not a nerd. I am, I am, <laughs> I, I, am kind, I am kind of a nerd about language. Um, there's no difference for them between I have eaten and I ate. The I have and then a verb, mm-hmm. which is the, the, like the present perfect or the passe composé, and that in the simple past, there's no difference. And like when you're like, whoa, like they literally don't, they don't like have any, they just use one of them. Like they have the simple past, but it's only for like they use for certain language forms. It's like they literally do not distinguish the difference between these two different times, you know, or they have like a subjunctive mood. They have ways of expressing things that are not definable as fact that exist, but ways that you feel about them that we don't really use. We don't even really use the subjunctive mood. So I think I started to see and understand so much more that the things that I thought were so solid and that I was so confident about. And they're like, yeah, it's definitely this way. And I'm right. And these other people are wrong. And da, da, da. I was like, oh, like it's totally made up. Yeah. And so I think I have, uh, I think it really developed uh, an openness to humility in me. I don't know that it made me, I don't know if it like actually made me humble. I think I still, I still hold on to things that I think, you know, like I know and I'm right and I know these things. But it really opened me up to just be, to, to question everything I believe. And things that I think that are so true and so right. And I read this thing, you know, whatever the thing is, and just be like open to like really hearing maybe there's another way or maybe there's another truth about this at the same time. Like, mm-hmm. yes, this is, this is really, this I'm going into like supplements or science or, or like uh, the importance of meat, right? Mm. There's probably certainly things that are, that are, that are, and we've done enough studies on this and we've seen what happens and like, this is, you know, animal protein is superior in terms of EAA composition. Mm-hmm. Like it just is. It's like, it's going to give you, it's more digestible and there's more of the EAAs. It's going to stimulate more muscle protein synthesis. And so like, if your goal is more protein synthesis, like it's better than these plant proteins. That said, maybe there's another thing that's true about plant protein sources that's different, mm-hmm. that's separate of that. And in the past, I think I might've just been like, no, only this thing, you know? Um, and so I think it's just, uh, it's made me, much more open and adaptable to find new truths and new information and be adaptable and just like move, just keep going and not get like all hung up on myself and what I think is like true. Yeah. As someone that's <clears throat> been and spent time in a bunch of other countries, is there anything that you did in particular that really helped you like embed yourself as a local and just get the most out of your experience in all these other countries? I think committing to being in one place, you know, I think it's different to be a traveler versus you know, be part of something. And so I think uh, if I was speaking to someone else who's maybe entertaining the idea of uh, learning from being in other countries, try to get involved in something local. If you can get a job, like that's Mm -hmm. the best, you know? If you can go to school or take classes, that's good. But you could volunteer at an organization that you're passionate about, or you could... um, you know, get a girlfriend or get a boyfriend. Uh, I mean, they always talk about that for learning languages, but like for real, like just really get involved with the, with the local people, I think. Um, and if it's a foreign language, I think I maybe mean, it's the things I just want to challenge more than anything else. People think learning a foreign language is so hard. Like anything that you want to be good at, you have to practice it. Like if you want to suddenly pick up a sport or you want to pick up an instrument, you're not just going to be good at it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, maybe some people are musically talented. Some people are athletic, but you got to, you got to, you got to do skill practice fundamentals. If you practice something for 500 hours, like legit practice, not like kind of do it, but like you legit practice for 500 hours, you'll get pretty good at it. If you legit practice a language for 500 hours and treat it like an, like an, like an adult, look at the grammar, understand it, break it down, study the phonetics, just learn it. Just don't be a little bitch about it and just like study it and learn it it will open up so much for you. You'll like get to, you'll get understand so many more things that are going on and what's happening and you'll be so much more engaged and stimulated. And so I think like, um, learning, learning the language is Mm. just, and it doesn't have, you don't have to become fluent, but like 500 hours, like legit. I'm not saying Duolingo. I'm like, break it down, study it, learn it. You will, 
you'll get a whole nother perspective on life. And honestly, I think you'll even find a whole new perspective of yourself. Mm. Like there's a, there's a, a French Angelo that kind of, it's like a different, you know, <laughs> a different person. <laughs> it, I mean, it's not like a totally different person, yeah. but um, I mean, and I think maybe even like someone who's like played team sports, like when you play a certain sport, you kind of like become a certain version of yourself. Yes. Cause like you maybe have certain gifts or skills and it's like, uh, you play this role on the team. Mm. And then if you're like in a different group and you're playing a different role, or maybe you're in a band, you're playing an instrument now, it's like you're like a little bit different. Like the way that you can express yourself and how you create value in the group is so different. Uh, it, it's, like, it's like that, you mm. know? But, it, you know, you just... Totally different ways of expressing yourself. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say studying a different language teaches you how to express yourself in a different way through a different language, but trying to do it in the same medium so you're, you're teaching yourself how to express yourself better in a completely different paradigm, like completely different version of yourself, which, I mean, is there a better way to develop as a person studying words and studying how you actually want to articulate your thoughts and your feelings? Like, there really isn't. I think that's a very nuanced, awesome insight. Yeah, uh, yeah it's like when you have to, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's other awesome ways. Like, I don't know. It's the best way, but trying to break down like, wow, what am I feeling? And what am I thinking? And what am I wanting? And what am I really trying to say? I don't even right. mean like in a deep way, but like, <laughs> do I want a sandwich or do I, or like, you know, or like, do I want, even when you're trying to think about like, I want this, I want the sandwich, but then can I have the coffee afterwards or whatever? And like, just thinking about like time and those types of aspects. And then it goes into deeper things like around, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, you know, what you want your future to be like, like realizing, which I think a lot of kind of even mainstream self-help type stuff tells you, like control your words. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you, if you speak a bunch of negative stuff, like if you find yourself complaining about things and talking about the things you don't like or the things you don't want, you will manifest a lot less in your life of the things you do want than if you don't waste your time talking about that shit and you spend the you spend most of your time thinking about and talking about the things that you do want. And I think that uh, language helps, learning another language helps you identify what you're thinking and what you're trying to say and maybe how stupid and pointless it is. <laughs> and maybe there's something else you like really want to say. Right, yeah. You know? You got to talk to us a little bit about the uh, silent retreat that you did. Because the way that I understand it, that was kind of like a genesis <laughs> moment for starting Keon, wasn't it? Or at least getting yourself back to the US. Like it gave you incredible clarity. Right? Yeah. I mean, I've done many of them. So that's like- Maybe it was I, like 2011 or two, 2012 yeah, was 2000, the first one. It's the 2012 yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, well, so I mean, I got really exposed to silent meditation in must have been 2002 mm -hmm. and uh, 2001, 2002. And- started daily practice and was meditating, you know, 20 minutes a day, twice a day and started going on like longer retreats, 10 day retreats, et cetera. And, uh, and I, I went in and out of my commitments to that and like which tradition or who I thought, you know, what, what modality I thought made the most sense. But in 2012, I went on a Vipassana course and in India, and basically it's a 10 day course where you <clears throat> Uh, you, it's this like 10 and a half hours a day of meditation. And, uh, they have these all over the world where I was, it was like very minimalist and very hot and like flies. And like, it was like, you know, it was, uh, it was, um, very rustic, I guess I'd say. Yeah. So it's 10 hours a day of meditation. There's no reading, no writing, no talking and no eye contact. And I think the no eye contact is really, um, it's really awesome because you just, it's just you, man. Like there's no, you can't even look at someone and be like, oh man, you know, like without saying anything, isn't this like hard? <laughs> you know, it's like, you got to just, you're just in your own. There's no outside validation of any of your thoughts and there's no outside processing of any of your thoughts, or your feelings. It's all just within you. And I, that style also is the style of meditation is basically like body scanning over the course of the 10 days, you develop more and more of this practice of observing sensation throughout your body and moving where your attention is to, to observe the sensation on your body. And I think what happens is a lot of thoughts you can imagine come up even just in an hour. Mm -hmm. Like you sit quietly for an hour, man. You're thinking about this and that and like what you want to do next and regretting something you did before and you know, thinking about career and then your girlfriend and then health and oh, I want to do this. And so after 10 days, 
kind of what's left is like what could be sustained in the fire of your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like yeah. whatever's left, man, it's like the only thing that's stuck. There's a it. bunch of other stuff burned through, you know? Do you feel like you built a better relationship with yourself through that? Like kind of discovered some things that you just like need to let go of or things you need to lean into more? Because I mean, that amount of time just spending with yourself is n not common. Like Most people are like, well, you went 10 days just solo, no eye contact with anyone. Like it's an intense experience. Yeah, I think it's evolving. Mm. You know, I think um, I've, done, I've done that specific retreat, I don't know, six or seven times. And I've done many others that many days. And I've done a lot of primitive wilderness stuff, you know, just like out in the woods uh, alone. So I don't know that it's like ever done. <laughs> you know, I think practicing spending time with yourself and being quiet and not, uh, not trying to plan or figure out what you're going to do next or, you know, kind of like solve it all in some way nor get validation from others, I think is a really good practice. And I would encourage everyone to find some way of doing it. If it's camping alone, mm -hmm. if it's going to some kind of meditation retreat, if it's like just finding ways to just be alone is, is super healthy. So yeah, I think um, it is one of the components in my life that has really helped me to just be okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well yeah. What was the moment for you where you finally were like, fuck it, I'm doing this. Keon, I don't even know if it was Keon uh -huh. at the time. This is happening. And like, what was the first product that you were thinking about getting to market? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So fast forward. I mean, really the, the conclusion of that, the conclusion of that retreat was really, I was like, I'm going to just choose my wife. I wasn't married to yet, but I'm gonna choose this woman. I'm going to make her the priority. You know, what's up to the next day. I got out of the retreat. I called her and I was like, you know, whatever you want to do, let's do that. Let's move to Boulder. That's where you've been wanting to move. So I quit my job. I was working with Apple there. I quit my job and I moved to Boulder the next day. So literally it was like one day, two day, moved to Boulder and, uh, tried to honestly tried several different businesses. I tried launching some different businesses and partners with guys I had met in India and some Swedes. Um, and I got into running a behavioral healthcare company for a few years. Um, that was a really cool company that's, that supported young adults with, uh, really awesome holistic living. So it, it was, I was back in health basically. I think that was like, I was kind of finally back into health and, um, you know, man, I don't know if there was really like a precise moment mm -hmm. like that. The way that I think about it now is it's really coming back to your roots. And, um, like I said earlier, my family was very into health and they were, uh, at that stage of my life, when I was a young kid, we were actually pescatarians. Um, and I don't, I don't actually know all the reasons why like we weren't eating like chicken and beef and stuff then. But because of that, and because of my parents' <clears throat> acknowledgement of like protein nutrition, we talked about protein nutrition and amino acid nutrition a lot about like why we had to combine these certain like rice and beans in certain ways. Because if you don't, then you're not getting protein or, you know, certain types of fish, et cetera. And my, my mom gave me amino acids as a kid. Uh, and we talked about amino acids as a kid. And I don't know if she brainwashed me as a kid. Like, can't you feel them? Like, can you feel how awesome they feel? Because you can, you can feel them really. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think I, I had stopped, I'd gotten out of the behavioral healthcare company. I wanted to start my own thing. And I think it's kind of like when you really want to try to start your own thing, you can get distracted by, what's the hottest, coolest new thing? Or what's this thing that like has got all this demand on the market? Or how do I do something? How do I be like unique and special and different versus being like, what do I really, well, maybe, this is, maybe this is a great example, actually a tie back to the whole meditation thing is rather than trying to figure out something that's like special or unique or different or this kind of perfect validation, you need customers. You need to make something people mm -hmm. want. But with just what is something that I like, that I love, that I'd be willing to put my name on, that I want to give to my family, to my kids that I want to try to promote, that I want everyone to know about, that um, I'm going to be really proud of in my life. And that can help me earn a living. And that will also enable me to build a company and a culture and work with people in a way that's really fulfilling for me and that I love. And it was really, I think, um, you know, after, uh, after years of like running other people's companies, being like, I, you know, it's time, like I want to build 
something that like that I can really believe in and be fully passionate about. Mm. And I don't know, man, it's like I, I built the thing like my, you know, what my parents loved, you know? Yeah. And I, I didn't build it because of that, but it's hard not to see it that way now. Totally. <laughs> was, uh, was EAA's product number one? Yeah. For, yeah. Oh. Yeah. There were actually a few that kind of came out at, at the same time, trying to do like a few products. And over time, just realizing like that was the, that is, that, that was our hero product. That's remained our hero product. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's the one that's still that I think we only make products that really create value for people. Mm-hmm. Like if you take this, it's going to have a specific effect and you will really you know, like, it's, it's something you could take every day. Yeah. Um, out of all that though, I still think EAAs are outside of like our whey protein isolate are like the most fundamental supplement. Mm. Um, for most people based off their chosen diet, activity levels, et cetera. Was there an inflection point early on where you realized, hey, this is much more than just a product. I actually have a business here that could be really successful or um, I, I can actually turn this into a business. Um. No, I mean, it's, it started as a business play. Like, yeah. I think it's, it started as a business play. Like, hey, how do we build this business? And, um, and what are things that we're passionate about? What are good products? It, it started that way. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, I, it wasn't like, um, uh, I don't know. You, you know, like, like chasing like, an opportunity that was like, I seem like there's something missing in the market. It was more like, yeah, this is a great, right? like, let's build a supplement company and what are good products and what right. are the ones that like actually matter and will actually help people and that are really, you know, that are good. Yeah. I think it's something you were really proud of too. Yeah. I'm really proud of like, it's, it's kind of that, that simple. Yeah. Mm. People just overcomplicate this shit so <laughs> I, much. I really think people overcomplicate it. And it's, I mean, more than anything, even like we, like you guys asked, it's like, we started with several things, right? But it's proven out that like, EAAs are the hero product and they're the ones that like are the most important. And maybe that's just a message for any aspiring entrepreneurs. Just pick something and start doing it. Yes. Pick something that you believe in and start doing it. You don't have to be the first one. You don't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be like totally brand new and specific. It's like do something well, you Mm -hmm. know, it's like, I mean, you can look at, uh, I'm not trying to tell people to go into this business, but like, let's say there are people that have really successful, um, companies as electricians. Maybe it's more like a service provider. It's like, you can be very successful as an electrician or very successful as a um, personal trainer mm-hmm. or very successful as, um, I don't know, man, a roofer. Or it's like, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm noticing I'm choosing everything that's more like service companies, <laughs> yeah. but there's plenty of product companies that are similar and supplements is another one. It's like, if you really, really like love supplements, you know, and you think they're an awesome product and you would be proud to to like have that be what you spend your day thinking about, talking about, trying to make the best version of it, um, trying to find the right, you know, partners and advertising to like work on it. Like, you know, you can do it. Yeah. Whatever it is, you can do it. You just got to be committed. And it maybe goes back to the language piece. It will not come easily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It will not be this thing where it's like, oh, I'll just like do Duolingo for 15 <laughs> minutes a day and suddenly I speak a language. Or like, oh, I'll just, you know, um, I don't know, buy like white labeling so we just get someone else's product. Like I'm just going to do like this white label thing and then I'll just kind of market it on the side and kind of figure out how it works. It's like, man, that's not, you're going to have to bust your ass. So it's like, what are you willing to bust your ass for to, um, to, you know, just to have a great life, yeah. you know? To like, does, yeah. I was going to say, it does make me wonder if like this zero to one Peter Thiel methodology rubs people. It's it's teaching the wrong thing because I think a lot of new entrepreneurs think in terms of the lines of like disruption or I need to create something that's brand new and disrupt the entire market versus like what you just said. What do I actually give a shit about doing? Can I do it with passion? Can I create something that's unique and just carve out your own slice of the pie and you can build an amazing business for yourself that you love doing and impact a ton of people? It doesn't need to be this like zero to one mass disruption type thing to start a business. Just connecting again parts from our previous, from like previous parts of our conversation, there may be more than one truth. Like the zero to one thing, without trying to say that's not accurate, like I am a version of a very different story. And mm-hmm. so is my company that it's not like that at all. Yeah. It's not choosing, like literally, even the research behind our EAAs, it's all publicly available. 
I mean, luckily there's hundreds of studies, right? But it's like in our label, it says exactly what's in it. Like anyone, anyone can go copy it. If you want to try to go copy it, it's hard to go copy it, (laughs) you know, because it's like to make something of this premium quality and find the suppliers and get it done well and build a reputation. Like, you know, so like rather than trying to do something disruptive, there is another path. Maybe that's Mm -hmm. the thing. Like rather than saying like that being disruptive thing is the wrong path. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, it's definitely not the only path. There's definitely Mm -hmm. a path simply of choose something you believe in that people want work hard every day to make it a good thing and go and sell it to people and then treat those people that you sell it to really well. And I think that you will be successful. <laughs> you know, a great framework. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, but if you don't do one of those things, if you don't make it good and then you sell it to people and then they're disappointed that it wasn't good. Right. Mm-hmm. Or you can sell it to them, but then maybe they, maybe it's even good, but they don't like it. And then you have like crappy customer service. You know, it's like, it's going to come back to bite you. Like, mm-hmm. but it's not that complicated. It, it really can be like, you know, choose something that's good. Yeah. I won't repeat it all again. <laughs> but yeah. you mentioned the word believe twice. And yeah. from my perspective, it seems like a lot of people don't have, or they're not anchored very firmly in their own beliefs or they struggle to identify what their true belief is, whether it's like in themselves or like in something that they think could happen. Um, like if someone's just passionate about yoga and they believe it's the best thing that you can do for your body, mm-hmm. They're, you know, that type of person could easily go start a yoga studio. And if they love it that much, they're probably going to have a lot of success if they can put everything else in place. But is there anything that you've done that pulled that belief and like really made you like firmly believe? Or do you have any advice for people to kind of develop belief? Because it is something that I think holds a lot of people back. Yeah. This could be its own, I think this could be almost like its own yeah. podcast because yeah. I think it's such an interesting topic. I think um, a few things. One is spending time alone and being quiet will really help you. I really think that like go, go on a long camping trip by yourself or a hiking trip or go on a meditation retreat or something like that. And it will help you uncover and see some of the stories that you have about yourself and about other people that are like, that are really just stories. And they're probably holding you back or they're keeping, they're keeping some other thought or some other desire or something else from emerging. I think another really good activity is actually to directly write down all of your excuses. So write down your fears, write down how your mom or your dad's holding you back or your partner or this thing or society or something about your identity or like whatever it is. All, write down all your stories about your fears and all the ways in which you're stuck. Like just write them all out. Like give them full voice and don't say like, oh, that one's stupid. I shouldn't explain that. Because if it's in there, like mm. you got to get it out and really allow them to be all written out and, and like give them the time to do that. And then let that sit. Come back a day, two days later, maybe a week later and write a challenge to every single one of them. Write about how it could be different. Take a creative approach to how maybe the way in which your dad has programmed you to think that you have to do whatever he wants you to do or whatever. It's like, maybe that's actually like the challenge, the opportunity to get you to do something different. Mm. Or maybe because of um, a lack of privilege in your life, there's some unique opportunity to actually support more of those people who don't have that lack of, that also struggle with that lack of privilege. But there's some like way in which you, you know, unite with them and connect with them and can make some special offering for them or something like that. Again, I don't, I don't know everyone's solutions to what mm-hmm. they are, but right. you then take that proactive, creative opportunity. I think that's a really important step because I think there's a bunch of like gunk that we have that we don't allow ourselves to even imagine what we want to do or what we believe in or what we care about because we just think it's like, not okay or not safe or something. There's some story. And then after that, I think um, do really hardcore brainstorming where you just let out all the ideas and like get like stupid ideas, you know, like um, things that are literally impossible that you think could never be done and just really give yourself the space and the time to express all of the potential ideas of what you care about, what you maybe want to do, et cetera. And this could be a business. It could even just be your life. Like, you know, maybe you don't have an idea for business, but maybe it's ideas about what you want to do next. Like you feel like you're stuck in your town. You want to go to some other town or you want to, whatever it is, just explore all the possibilities. And once you've got all of them out, then I think taking time to cull through them, like which are the ones that like you really 
passionate about and the ones that you're not. And like they, you were just kind of challenging yourself. And when you get down to the, the few that are like what you actually are excited about, then pause again and wait and let them just kind of sit for a while. Don't try to figure out how you're going to get them done. Because as soon as you try to start thinking about how you're going to get them done or choose one, you're going to immediately going to have all your critiquing brain mm-hmm. come about how it's not possible. You don't have the resource and da 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 and let that sit. And then wait a little bit and then come back and cool them down again. And when you get down to like enough where it's like, man, this is what it is. Like, this is what I really like and this is what I care about. Then consider how you could achieve that over a very long period of time. Which maybe this challenge is like, not the zero to one, but the idea that people are going to like have this, you're going to like, you need to have a big breakthrough thing and it's going to happen right away. It's like probably you're going to do a big breakthrough thing. It's going to take a longer time or something. Like imagine not that you're going to manifest these dreams, these beliefs, like in six months, but what if it took, what if it was five years or 10 years and suddenly it starts to feel more expansive and like you can figure it out and you can start to build a plan about how you're actually going to get there. Mm-hmm. So maybe that was like a really long answer, but no, was no, great. I really do think Cold. that's the recipe. Yeah. Like it reminds me a lot of, um, like Tim Ferriss's fear setting exercise that he recommends in Tools of Titans. And I think I did it maybe like 2018 or 2019 when I was in New York City. And it's very similar to you, list out all your fears. And the only difference is like, if that, if that fear material material arises, material, materializes. I, I can't speak, <laughs> but if it happens, materializes, the tongue twister, <laughs> yeah. um, what would you do? Like, mm-hmm. what would your solutions actually be? So you go through this exercise and you're like, oh shit, if I got into financial trouble, these are the three or four things that I would do. Okay, I'm actually good. And also a lot of these fears are just things that I've just materialized in my own head. It's not actually real. It's such a powerful exercise. And then to your point, you take it a step further and just be like, just take one step towards that thing. Like our whole brand just started writing tweets. That's all we did. We didn't think podcasts. We didn't think blogs. We're like, let's just start tweeting and just putting some content out about nutrition just for ourselves, just to be creative because we were working jobs. And next thing you know, like everything starts to grow and expand and you have a whole business, but it just started with that one step in the right direction. Maybe that for you was just EAAs. Maybe it was just the, mm-hmm. the quiet retreat, but you just took that step. I mean, I, I, think, I think your final point there is really important for any aspiring entrepreneurs is it doesn't have to be some big complex thing. It literally can just be the tweeting. Yeah. And I found actually, you know, what, what I have learned more through this process of building a successful company is the less that I do the less that I focus on, the less new products, the less like Mm. all the novelty and the more it's like fewer things done to the level of great, not good, but like to the level of great, my success and the success of all the people that are in it with me is amplified. Mm. And so it's like, it can just be like, write great tweets. Yes. <laughs> you yeah. know, and then they'll start to build momentum and they'll garner interest. And then it will, and then it will, then whatever's next will emerge, mm-hmm. you know, versus trying to, we're going to do, we need to do the tweets and we need to do this and the podcast and that, and then we should build this and that. It's like, you can't do it all at once. No. Yeah, the momentum is incredible because for our show, we just, we did like five episodes the first month and we did like 30 the next month. And at that point, people were starting to engage with us on Twitter about the episodes we were putting out. And we're like, I guess we're just doing this. Like yeah. we're podcasters now. And then we just kept going. So there's something to just the power of building a little bit of momentum when it comes to forming a new habit, new business, whatever it is. You just need to get that momentum wheel going and you can then figure out stuff as you keep going. Action. Yeah. Like action, action breeds more action. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And w- one other metaphor I like to use is like, the, if you have every day as a piece of paper, if you put it down in the same place each day, after 365 days, you have a book. If you put it down in a different place every single day, you just have like a room full of papers. Mm. And so even just like the consistency of tweeting and then like we're going to record five podcasts and 30 podcasts. Now you've got like a stack of like 30 podcasts. Like that's, yes. that's a legit booklet. Right. You know, you do another 70 and boom, you've got a book. You know, it's like, um, yeah, just consistent action. And if it can be relatively in the same place, yeah, you'll find, you know, you'll find more benefit. 100%. You touched on EAAs. And mm-hmm. I something I've never gotten asked you before is why, from a supplement perspective, why does everyone just focus on BCAAs? And it seems like a small percentage of the population actually knows about EAAs, even though it's such an amazing supplement that everyone should be taking. I think it's just the nature of capitalism and marketing, marketing. and momentum, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so basically, BCAAs are, it stands for branched chain amino acids which is uh, uh, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. They are three of the nine essential amino acids. And the science of 
branched chain amino acid starts, you know, well, the, the, the study of it starts 40, 50 years ago. And what they discovered was that these three branched chain amino acids were very, very important for muscle protein synthesis. And leucine primarily basically kickstarts the process of muscle protein synthesis, which is the, the building of new muscle protein, mm-hmm. um, building your muscle. And, um, and the other two are really important for it. And they discovered this kind of, you know, the, these mechanistic, the mechanistic nature of these three amino acids. And from that, the sports supplement and, you know, the marketing around that realized like, wow, we can really market this and sell this. And so that began. And as we continued to study it and learn more about the branched chain amino acids, we discovered not recently, you know, uh, at least 20 years ago, 20, 30, maybe 20, 30 years ago, we realized that you must have all nine essential amino acids, not only the three branched chain amino acids to create an anabolic response, mm. to, to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. The three branched chain amino acids on their own are not anabolic. There's very clear studies on it now. Uh, there's a great meta-analysis from, it must be like six years old now. Um, they just show like it just, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't do that. Um, there could be some cases of using BCAAs. It's interesting though. I think that they make the most amount of sense in a pragmatic approach for a deficient, for a protein deficient diet where you're eat like, uh, basically if you're like vegan and you're trying to combine certain types of plant proteins Um, and you added BCAAs on top of them, you could kind of formulate your own more ideal protein that would look more like an animal protein. Mm. Um, But it's not. In short, BCAAs are a waste of your money and you shouldn't buy them or use them. Um, In some cases, they're even catabolic because of the the stress that they put on the system when you take them. Whereas essential amino acids are all nine of the essential amino acids and you can formulate them to uh, look like an ideal protein protein, like, uh, which is basically like a, like a whey protein. It's like an, the closest thing. You can actually formulate essential amino acids to be even a better formula than that and to create three times the muscle protein synthesis of a whey protein. Um, so actually, basically the opposite. A BCAA is worthless, doesn't do anything, and an essential amino acid uh, formula is even, I'm not saying to replace eating dietary protein or like eating whole food protein, mm-hmm. um, but to supplement it has an even greater impact than whole food protein does. Mm. But in short, the reason why is that marketing gets a hold of something, sports mm. supplement industry gets a hold of something, keeps making money off of it. And, you know, a lot of people, um, both in the industry and on the customer side, they simply don't care enough, mm-hmm. you know? Are there any other misunderstandings around protein that you wish more people knew about? Um, you know, I think... I think the most important, I mean, and there's so much about protein. I mean, just to start, I would just say protein is fundamentally different than fat and carbohydrate, fats and carbohydrates. Uh, you know, the primary role of carbohydrates and fats that our body use them for is for energy. And um, without debating, you know, like what's the best source of energy, um, you know, if you eat too much carbohydrates or fats, or if you eat more than you move in a day, then that is how you will gain fat on your body. Because your fat, basically fat on the body is to store excess energy for times when you don't have enough energy. Mm. Protein can be used, can get into converting to sugar and then ultimately converted to fat. But the primary role of protein is fundamentally different. The primary role of protein is to literally help you rebuild the protein in your body. When you eat dietary protein, it's helped to rebuild the proteins in your body. And the proteins in your body make up literally most of your body, like the majority of over half of your solid mass. And naturally that includes your muscle, but it includes all of your vital organs. It includes your skin, your eyes, your hair. Um, it includes enzymes. When we talk about enzymes, those are proteins. Your neurotransmitters are um, the derivatives of those proteins. They're amino acids themselves. And so uh, eating protein is like just so crucial to life um, and to existing, uh, you know, as, as a human being and having a vibrant life. And it's, it's just, it's, it's very, it's just weird. Like over the last, I know, 10 years, with all the development of keto, like so much focus on fat and arguing about carbs and fat. And it's like, 
in the end, I think the benefit that most people are experiencing, honestly, in any of these diets is like when they just eat enough protein. If you mm-hmm. eat enough protein, you will feel much better. Your mood will be much better. You'll build and maintain more lean muscle, which will improve your um, like all of your blood sugar regulation. It'll improve your cardiovascular health. It'll imp- it'll increase your basal metabolic rate. So literally, you'll you have a higher metabolic rate and just be burning more calories. Um, it is really, I think, more and more we discover like the key to longevity and is the most correlated to reducing all cause mortality than really anything else. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, protein. Um, it's really important. <laughs> so I don't, know if, I don't know if that's like not uh, something that's you know misunderstood. I, I think it's just not. I think people just don't understand. Like yeah. they, you think you're eating this food and it's kind of all like energy, you know, and it's like protein is its primary role is actually not energy. It's, it's to, it's the building materials. It's, it's the, uh, it gets broken down into the chemicals that stimulate the development of the new protein. And it actually is the building materials for rebuilding your organs and your muscle and, and even your mood mm-hmm. to the degree that it's the neurotransmitters. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. Um, so if I'm getting sufficient protein, like at least a gram per pound of body weight, mm-hmm. should I still be taking EAAs even if I'm eating a lot of nutrient-dense animal foods? I think it depends on what your goals are. Mm-hmm. I think that if if you are eating a gram of protein per pound of body weight and you are, and, and that protein is all like animal protein, mm-hmm. um, and you're spacing it out like pretty evenly throughout the day, uh, because I would say that like, it also matters like how much protein you eat at one sitting based off how much of it is actually used for new protein synthesis versus converted into sugars. Um, if you're kind of ideally eating, you know, your protein broken apart in these, these aspects throughout the day and you're not like uh, doing any kind of like extended fasting um, and you're like relatively active and you're young, um, I think and you're not doing like super intense exercise, I think that you probably don't, you, know, you don't have to supplement. I mean, you never have to supplement. Mm-hmm. The reason why essential amino acids start to make a lot of sense as a supplement is if you like to fast, they really make sense because anytime you go more than three, four hours without eating protein, you go into net muscle protein loss. You're losing the muscle that you have built because your muscle is the reservoir of amino acids for the rest of your body. And your body, all the proteins in your body are in a constant state of turnover. And so your heart, your kidneys, your liver, like they can't just not replace the proteins that they're made up Mm -hmm. of. Like when those proteins break down, need to be rebuilt. Um, So when you break down the proteins in your body, they break down into essential, they break down into the 20 amino acids. Some of those amino acids get reused to rebuild the proteins and some of them get discarded as urea, you pee them out. Uh, So you have to rebuild your organs, right? Or you must have amino acids for uh, neurotransmitters. So where do you get those from if you don't eat? You break down your muscle tissue. Your muscle tissue is the reservoir for the rest of your body, which is why it's so important as you age to have lean muscle Mm. because you're going to go through stages where you get injured or you have an illness or something like that. I mean, having more muscle mass is, is, has amazing, there's amazing research showing like the reduction of death from cancer. I'm not saying that like, it's directly time to saying that when you have more muscle, you can live longer because you actually have more amino acids to live off mm. of to support all of your organ function. Mm. So, um, sorry, I'm going back to the thread of like why, uh, when like if you need EAAs, if you're getting sufficient protein, yeah, if you're getting yeah. sufficient protein. So I was just going to say, um, if you are super active, you're going to have higher needs for essential amino acids. Um, So if you're a young person in this case, I would just say that um, like if you want to have basically like more gains from your exercise, essential amino acids are, the way way we can measure the way that muscle protein synthesis takes place is basically it's it's the amount of essential amino acids it's how digestible they are and how, uh, and how quickly they become available in the blood. And so the reason why essential amino acids would create three times the impact of muscle protein synthesis of say a whey protein before resistance exercise is because they're immediately available in the blood and they're at a very high concentration and they have twice the amount as whey protein Mm. because whey protein is only about half, it's actually less of essential amino acids. The other half is the non-essential amino acids, which you don't 
you don't, I mean, I'm not, again, telling you not to eat whole food protein, but like you don't need as many of the non-essential amino acids. They do get converted into glucose via gluconeogenesis and into urea. So you don't use them all. So in and around training, essential amino acids are much more efficient than protein. Mm. They're going to give you greater muscle protein synthesis. They're going to do a better job of reducing muscle fatigue, and they're going to do a better job of improving recovery time. So for exercise, they're kind of like, they're, they're, they're definitely superior to a whole food protein for those impacts. Um, oh, sorry, I lost. I was talking earlier about fasting. Sorry, fasting. That's, that, that was the threat. Yeah, so like if you like to fast, uh, I would definitely recommend taking essential amino acids during the periods when you're fasting because otherwise you're just going against your gains for mm-hmm. maintaining lean muscle. It just doesn't really you know, make, make much sense. Um, I'm not encouraging you to be like a bodybuilder and set alarms at four in the morning and, you know, <laughs> pound, eight, 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 <laughs> pound EAs at four in the morning and again at seven, you know, that frequently. And then I think, um, you know, I don't know how relevant this is directly for your audience, but as you age, it starts at age 30, but it gets progressively worse at age 40, age 50, age 60. Uh, sarcopenia starts to emerge, which is basically the loss of muscle mass. And the reason for the loss of muscle as we age is that we have more difficulty breaking down protein We can't digest the protein as well. And we're also less sensitive to the stimulation of muscle protein synthesis from the essential amino acids that are actually in the protein, even a Mm. a great animal protein. So as you age, like I quoted the three times muscle protein synthesis of whey protein, that's like before resistance training. Um, It's two times even outside of resistance training. Um, As you get older though, it can start to become three, four, five times. That's not because the, um, like the, it's not because the essential amino acids are becoming more effective. It's because the meat is becoming less effective. Got it. You simply will not be able to digest meat and it will not stimulate as much muscle protein synthesis in your body as you age. Mm. EAAs overcome that anabolic resistance because they don't require digestion. They don't require being broken down and they immediately reach peak concentration levels in the blood. Mm. So for purposes of longevity, and if you're 40, 50, especially if you're 60, 70 years old, they are a very wise thing to supplement in your diet. Mm. And more like, you could say like more meat will, um, could make up for it. But at some point it's like, man, you're eating, um, you're eating a lot of meat and you're also having a harder time with like basically consuming that amount of calories because you do Got become it. less metabolically efficient as you age as well. Mm. So I think the main purposes are like around training, it makes a lot of sense. If you have a hard time getting that full gram of protein per pound of body, which honestly a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think some people can do it, but you gotta be, you gotta be dedicated. Yeah. It's like, it's a lot of meat um, or it's like a lot. And if you eat, you know, dairy stuff, it's like a lot of meat and Greek mm. yogurt or whey <laughs> protein. Like it's just, you know, um, you know, I think another, uh, another thing is like weight loss for anyone who's trying to lose weight. The more that you stimulate muscle protein synthesis, which is what happens when you consume essential amino acids via protein or via supplement. Um, the more that you do that, you, there's diet induced thermogenesis. You're increasing your metabolic rate simply by, the, by t- rebuilding the proteins in your body, but also the more muscle mass that you have, the higher the resting basal metabolic rate. And so, I think um, if you're really trying to constrain, you know, the amount of food calories that you eat per day, but you're really trying to hit those higher protein levels because cutting calories, but cutting protein and the essential amino acids and protein is a terrible idea for losing weight. Cutting calories will help you lose weight. Yeah. (laughs) But if you cut the protein, you're going to lose the muscle too. And when you lose the muscle, it's going to be that much harder to, uh, to, to stay fit. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, it's how can you retain as much muscle when you're losing fat, that is the goal. I think of most of any thoughtful weight loss plan. Mm. Are there any foods that you would recommend eating with the EAAs that help with utilization? Because I mean, supplements, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, they don't get utilized in their full capacity just because they don't have all the other things that you know you're e- digesting. EAAs, you can take them entirely alone. I mean, really? I think yeah, um, I think the it's probably like less relevant for your audience. If you take them, or maybe I'm wrong, if you take them with sugars or with carbs, because of the insulin response, it'll stimulate even more. And if you take it in around exercise, it'll stimulate even more muscle protein synthesis. It will also push more fluid into the cells. So it'll give you, it'll it'll increase the muscle mass size, but they're completely effective and work well simply on their own. 
Um, and there've been multiple studies that have shown that, but yeah, like in situations where they're really trying to like maximize the impact. So some of the most famous studies around this, uh, on showing that they work were studies that, that were done for NASA, where they were trying to see if they could help people maintain muscle mass, um, and strength outside of resistance training. Cause when people go into space, there's no gravitational mm-hmm. force. So like you just waste away and is there any way to do it through diet? And I think this is one of the things probably most misunderstood and i can tell that just from the instagram comments on 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 my post <laughs> that they think that uh simply consuming amino acids will not stimulate muscle protein synthesis that you have to have the stimulus of the resistance training itself which is incorrect resistance training is the ideal way to stimulate new muscle growth and muscle protein synthesis but they did a bed rest study where they had people at bed rest for 28 days and they administered to them essential amino acids in 15 gram doses six times a day at the end of the 28 days, the participants did not lose any muscle mass with no resistance training, no movement, et cetera, for 28 days, simply through the administration of the essential amino acids. Oh, Dude, that's unbelievable. That's so they just sat in bed all day, took EAAs, and they and, didn't and, lose, mu- lose well, muscle? So, yeah, so uh, they, they, they also ate, but through the administration of these additional essential amino acids and some sugars in these cases, they were able to stimulate enough muscle protein synthesis to have no, no muscle loss. They lost some strength. As you can imagine, you're not training the muscles at all, but they didn't lose mm-hmm. any muscle mass. Wow. How many, or go ahead. I was going to say, how many times a day do you personally like to take EAAs? It depends on like how much protein I'm eating yeah. and what my- Say a heavy training day. Uh, on, so first thing I, like, I do like to fast. Like I just like to like not eat first thing in the morning. And so- um, I wake up first thing in the morning. I take a lot, man, but like it's my company, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you don't have to you take, load it up, you don't take this yeah. much, but I take, I take 15 grams oftentimes at a time because it is linearly, uh, beneficial up to 15 grams. It's similar to protein. It's like, it depends on your, depends on your body weight and how much muscle mass you have. We'll just say approximately you're going to use about 45 grams of protein at once for muscle, for protein synthesis. When you consume more than that, you're still going to use the protein, but it's going to get converted into sugars. It's going to get converted into energy for you instead. Mm. So really, like if you eat around 45, 50 grams of protein at once, you're going to like optimally use it. Again, it depends on like how big you are. If you're a smaller female, it's going to be less. If you're a bigger dude, you can eat more. Um, But typically, similarly, because of how much more efficient and effective the EAAs are, about 15 grams is going to give you about that like the equivalent of like 45 grams of protein. Wow. Mm. Um, so that's kind of like, you could consume more than that, but it's going to have less benefit. I take about, I take 15 grams first thing in the morning. How many scoops is that? Uh, that'd be three scoops. Three scoops, okay. Yeah. Um, and then it depends, you know, like if I typically go on a walk then or whatever. If about three hours later, I... Um, I'll probably have aminos again, like again, like another three scoops, but instead I might have like, I might have like two scoops of protein. I might have like two scoops of whey protein with water and drink that instead. Um, and then later in the morning, um, and it, honestly, like it's kind of easier for me to take aminos and like not trigger like wanting to like eat a bunch of other stuff yeah. or something, you know? Right. So I kind of prefer them oftentimes over the whey protein, but it depends. Um, whey protein in that case would be great too. And the, the benefits of whey protein um, of an isolate in that case is that there are other minerals. Like there's other things other than just the essential amino acids. Even if I don't need all the non-essential to the degree that I'm getting, I'm like, there's glutamine and there's, um, yeah, there's other minerals, et cetera in it. Mm. Uh, and then have a good lunch with a lot of protein. Um, and then mid afternoon, it depends. I might eat a bunch of like jerky or something like that for like a snack, or I could end up, uh, taking aminos. I, I probably take uh, jerky, probably eat jerky like a few hours later. And then I do Muay Thai kickboxing training in the afternoon. And before that, I'll take 15 grams again. I'll drink five grams while I'm doing it. And I'll take another 10 to 15 afterwards. So that is a lot, you know, that's like, I'm almost like up to those, uh, <laughs> to this other, uh, you know, the NASA study that said, um, like I can do the most crushing hour and a half Muay Thai and like be totally fine the next day. Mm. I can go back and do it again. Um, so I think the benefits of it in and around exercise, like that you can really see like how much you can um, make exercising easier basically mm-hmm. and get more out of it. Um, yeah, I would say like, I, I primarily use it in and around exercise. If I'm trying to like curb like cravings, 
for something. It's basically like another way of, instead of having a protein shake or eating a bunch of beef jerky or something like that, mm. and during fasting periods in the morning. Like I think those, that's how most people use it is like kickstart your day in kind of the right way in and around exercise or instead, uh, it's, it's like a protein supplement snack replacement type right. thing too. You know, like those are the ways typically that I think most people find benefit from it. And it becomes easy too. Like if you have one of the packets or something, um, it can keep you from eating some kind of crap. I just throw know. them in my backpack. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. great information. I'm curious, you mentioned at the beginning of the show that you had a great relationship with your mom and how she taught you how to cook and eat and you know, a lot about nutrition, supplementing, and now you're a father. So I'm curious how you think about nutrition and teaching those same principles to your family so that they have the same passion for fueling themselves as you do. I love talking about it with my kids. <laughs> I try not to annoy them with it, you know, and like yeah. only talk about like when they want to talk about it and what yeah. they're most interested in. Um, you know, it's, um, it's cool. It's like, I think my son is older. My son's 10 and he definitely is interested in it and passionate about it. So he wants to ask, he, he asked me lots of questions about it. He wants to talk about it. He's, he's like definitely like an aminos and protein, like power user. He's a competitive basketball player too. So it nice. makes a lot of sense for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, um, I mean, it's interesting, you know, what probably comes up most is really protein and amino acid talk. Like that's what I talk most about because I am thinking about how are they going to feel later? And I'm like, if they don't eat protein in this meal, then I want them to take some amino acids. Cause if they don't, then I think most people think, oh, they're going to have like a sugar crash or something. It's like, they're not going to have a sugar crash later. Like they're going to be like hungry and they're going to be hungry for protein or amino acids and their brains are going to be taxed and their neurotransmitters are going to be taxed from this, this whole experience. And so, um, yeah, I'm just like really focused that I'm constantly talking about protein. Is there protein in that? You know, like mm -hmm. how did you have protein for breakfast or, you know, if you didn't, then, um, you know, we please have, <laughs> please have these key on <laughs> yeah. aminos, you know? And it's funny with my son too, like he's super, just growing up with like a dad who, you know, has a supplement company, like he's totally fine with like pills. So he'll just take capsules, you know, he'll like, he happily will Loves take it. Yeah, he'll happily take capsules. My daughter, it's like, it's gotta be the mango ice cold. And then the she'll drink damn it. good though. The mango's good, man. I like the That's, blue rest too. Yeah. They're all pretty damn I drink good. it in the sauna, like when I'm fasted or something like that. It's incredible. Is it, um, is it tough to balance like the level of nutritional expertise that you have with your kids when you also just want them to be a kid and maybe like, you know, eat if they want to have like junk food or something like that too, you just kind of let them do their thing or what, what is that balance like for you? Yeah. I think it's important to, look, I don't want to give them some like, uh, condition. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to give them some like demon or like something that they're like trying to fight against. So I think it's really about maybe my just overall perspective with parenting is try to choose environments that are going to create the least amount of struggle for them, where they're going to feel the least amount of like whatever values I'm trying to instill in them, like lots of challenges to that. And so just like, don't put them in environments where there's going to be like tons of junk food, you know, or yeah. don't put them in environments where there's going to be I don't know, social value stuff like I'm not into. Like I just, I just try to like not challenge them with, with things that are conflicting with that. That said, that kind of diversity ultimately is probably good, right? Because they're going to yeah. be exposed to that in their life. Um, but then it's like, yeah, I'm not weird. It's like, you know, it's like Halloween, they get a bunch of candy. It's like, you know, can you eat all that candy? You know, but there's kind of only so, I think they've learned there's only so much candy they can eat before they like feel sick and they don't mm -hmm. want it. Um, and I, I think I am like, I'm more just, I try to focus on the positives versus the negatives. Mm -hmm. So again, I think it comes back to, I focus on, have you had, have you had protein? Mm -hmm. You know, like that's kind yeah. of the question. And then if they have that much more room and they want to eat the cake or whatever, they want to have ice cream, like it's like, eat it, you know, as long as you got in like the good thing first. And then I think it's up to them to nuance and to understand over time, how does the sugar make them feel? How does it make them feel if they made sure they ate the good thing first and then they're trying, like, so they could get to eat the dessert? You yes. know, it's like, are they kind of like, Full, like too full now or sick or something. That said, if they ate something better in the day, which is something maybe I think I learned as a kid, like when my parents like, you got to eat everything on your plate before you can have dessert, is sometimes it would just be better if you just ate the dessert because you consume so much food. It's like, 
it's too much. Mm -hmm. Like, and so you're like overeating now, you know? So, and sometimes I'm kind of just thought like, you know, it's like, just let them eat the ice cream and then just like chill out and like, don't make them eat something else. Like they're not going to fall apart if they do that. The bigger issue is probably for me where it's like, (laughs) they're going to eat like carrot cake and ice cream. And I'm like, all right, I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna get that. But like, then they don't eat it, and it's like, well, oh, like I'll eat their remainder. Yeah, can't let it go to waste. <laughs> yeah, can't let it go to waste. You know, so I would say, um, I have a, uh, I have a dad layer just from eating their remnants. You <laughs> know, which I try not to. So you yeah, gotta yeah. get a carrot cake flavor for Kia. <laughs> oh, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, might be there you go. Protein Man. powder, carrot cake, protein powder. That, that would be good. damn good. That would Some be damn good. There yeah. Too. Yeah. Well, if you need any testing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So you said you're 39, right? Yeah. What uh, what are you the most excited about, about turning 40 and just kind of entering into the next decade? I am, I don't know. I don't know that I'm excited about like something being fundamentally different. I like the idea of utilizing like decades as a, as like a mile marker, you know, to try to get stuff done. And I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what do I want to do for my 40th party? And like, do I want to make this big social event or... Do I want to kind of try to, I don't know, I've thought about trying to produce some kind of like weird, like performance art event type thing, nice. like an experiential type thing. Um, but man, when it comes back to it, it's like, it's kind of more just the same, man. Like I love, I love being with my family and spending time with them while my kids are young. I love trying to be healthy. And so it, it feels like the same stuff, man. Like yeah. I'm, I'm like, you know, maybe I'll get like a bunch more like Muay Thai privates so I can like improve like just some of my technical stuff and feel more competent there. And uh, can I, you know, is there more research on like nutrition stuff that I'm really passionate about or some other specific types of like maybe resistance training modalities I'm not familiar with yet that I can learn about. And then I just want to spend time with my family. Mm. So it's like, it's not, there's nothing that like fresh or new. It feels like it's more of the same, but in a good way. I'm happy. That's awesome. Yeah, probably means you're in a great point in life, just enjoying everything that is in your life right now and spending more quality time with the things and people that matter. That's it. It's a great place to be. Um, I, well, I know Brett and I were excited for this conversation. I think it it definitely lived up to the hype and and definitely exceeded it. So Angelo, just excited to share this with our audience. Uh, maybe if you could just, uh, tell our audience where they can find you if they want to, you know, go listen to the next podcast that you're on or go do a deep dive for themselves. I, mean, I typically just say, man, like Keon is like what I poured everything into. So it's like, just please check out Keon. Yeah. Like it's like, and my whole team and like everything, you know, I just, I've poured so much into that. Um, so that's like getkeon.com. And if you just Google Angelo Keeley, you'll find me. I'm around. <laughs> or find you at Barton Springs, right? Yeah, you'll find me at Barton right. Springs. Yeah. You might have to hit Barton before you head out, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, we appreciate it, man. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you guys for having me. Cool. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>